Well, Bill Smite's going back to Estonia. I quit playing video games, and I'm currently nocturnal, which means... Can I raise the brightness of this in any way? I don't think so. Which means it's time to return to tradition of the Denp of Lock. That's correct, the Denp of Lock. <laughs> um, what was I going to talk about? I turned on the camera for a reason. I remember. Social media. I talked about this in a podcast that isn't out yet, so why did I even mention the fact that I did that? Um, see, I think uh, social media has proven to be a fad. Uh, as in, we don't really have it anymore. And frankly, for all the people who were complaining as much as they did while social media was a thing, we didn't really know how good we had it. Um, if you think about it, social media has basically been replaced by, um, I'm not sure what to call it. Someone, someone come up with a cool, fancy neologism for it or something. But, uh, compare the way we used to interact with social media, like Facebook, uh, or even Twitter back in the day, where you would follow, um, or MySpace, for example. I mean, there's a bunch of different examples. The older social media, it was basically a way to keep up with your friends and family. Um, and as time has gone on, it's moved away from two things. It's, it's, it's moved away from user curated and towards algorithmically curated uh, feeds. And because of that, it's moved away from a way to keep up with your friends, i.e. the social part of social media, and towards uh, influencer-based, where the communities gather into two separate classes. That are, the, the classes are obviously, it's more of a spectrum, right? It's, but, uh, you know, of the people who uh, watch, consume the content, and through their, uh, through their watching, uh, you know, as digital serfs, watching advertisements, pay for the content, um, and then those who, with the high follow accounts who produce the content. Uh, and this is not just the case on social video, as they're called, platforms like YouTube and TikTok, although those are the biggest examples, uh, but it's also the case on Instagram and Twitter, that uh, on Twitter, uh, everyone sort of conglomerates around bigger, higher follow account uh, accounts who are known for being funny and entertaining, uh, and yeah, they still follow their friends, uh, but a majority of people's feeds, and not everyone is like this, okay? You can still use Twitter to just exclusively follow uh, your friends and keep up with them. Um, but in general, the site seems to tend towards, uh, you know, these bigger accounts that have a larger reach that are, you know, even in a, a, a niche, they are influencers, which is a disgusting word, but that's what they are. Uh, and I, I'm talking about Twitter because that's the only one I'm familiar with. Uh, I don't use any other social media, but I do have a crippling Twitter addiction. Um, and it really is crippling. <laughs> Which I, I think is, is quite different. And I don't think really enough has been said about this change. Where even on the same platforms, the tendency has been away from this decentralized or digitally local uh, friend group based uh, communication towards an influencer based. Uh, like creator audience dichotomy. So social media is basically dead, uh, and I think there's, you know, the the as I said, the algorithmic feeds have been uh, really the the thing that pushed this. But it's not just the case that you give humans enough time and they accidentally create television every time. Uh, like it's important to remember that the executives of these companies making decisions are boomers whose experience is, with media is television. And so naturally, when they imagine what a successful media company looks like, even social media is still media, they are imagining television. And so of course these websites' designs are going to tend towards something that reflects what these people grew up with and how they see the world. You know, the, the, the successful YouTubers will tell you that YouTube's algorithm is fairly meritocratic and it shows you what people want to watch. It, 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 rec it rewards videos that people watch more. The uh, key Mr. Beast trick is like, even the, the file name of the video that you upload to YouTube servers, right, that you, the audience never sees, um, YouTube servers see that. And so like you put tags in the file name of the video. This is like a trick that all the top YouTubers use because 
and, and like this is the thing right is that if youtube really was just showing people what they wanted to see then in what way would the tags in a file name which they never get to see affect the quality of it? it obviously wouldn't so i think this like that alone purely disproves this theory that youtube actually just shows people uh, what like successful videos that people want to see instead all of the marketing around a successful youtube video is not marketing to the consumer it's marketing to youtube to youtube's algorithm um to whoever the ceo of youtube is it's not susan wojcicki anymore she left right I, I don't remember who the new ceo is uh and how this is very different from a market this is much closer to a feudal economy what does it mean i don't know what it means but it mean, it's, it's there Back when I was taking film classes, uh, we learned this important thing, which is that um, when it comes to video, you can the, the 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 actual video quality is forgivable as long as the audio quality is good. Um, human brains, for whatever reason, are much better. Like you 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 will get really distracted if something has poor audio quality. But as you can tell from this video right now, you can still tell exactly what's going on and don't care. Even though this video looks nothing like real life because it's super low resolution and compressed. And I think there's a version of this for video games, for video game worlds. Um, and I think the industry has gone in the complete wrong direction. Which is that it's very easy to make a photorealistic 3D environment. You might be saying to yourself, what the fuck are you talking about? Okay, here's how you do it. You can make a perfectly 100% photorealistic 3D environment uh, very easily. Here's what you do. It's called a photosphere. <laughs> you take a bunch of pictures of a real place in a sphere, right? 360 degrees. You put a camera, you, you, you stitch all the photos together, and you put a camera, like Google Street View, for example. Put a, put a camera in the middle, and you look around, and it looks exactly like real life. The problem is, as soon as you move, forward back when you move in any direction you don't just tilt and pan uh the illusion breaks um in order to actually be able to move through that world you have to 3d model it and you know make a video game uh, which is an in, uh, once you want photorealism uh it becomes an immense amount of effort and as someone who has now made a video game uh like it's an incomprehensible amount of effort that you'd have to put into to model everything texture everything everything in the world do all the lighting like it's it's just an insane amount of effort that has to go into making these uh near photorealistic environments that modern AAA games have uh but uh i think that the general consensus and something i agree with uh it's actually something that uh tim rogers brought up in uh the cyberpunk review which is uh, you can have a really impressively detailed 3D world, but it can still feel empty. Like, you can't go into any of the buildings. They're just sort of shells, right? Like, the people, they may exist, but they don't really interact with you. It can just, I mean, I think GTA 5 is like this in a, in a way. Like, it's a very complex 3D world, but, but it kind of feels like empty. It doesn't feel real. It doesn't feel lived in, and it kind of just feels like a place to put quest markers. Uh, and I think we started to figure this out in the 90s, that the real, it's kind of like that's the thats the, the really good video quality with poor audio quality. That's the metaphor I'm going for here. Because the, the, the real thing that matters is the, the interactability of the world. Um, in the documentary about Half-Life 1 that they that Val put out for the 25th anniversary, uh, there's a moment where Gaben says that, like, if you try and interact with the world, if you if you shoot the wall and there's no bullet hole, if you try and do something and the world ignores you, uh, I think he take he says the words he says that gives me a narcissistic injury. Uh, like I feel like I don't exist, like I don't matter, and I think that's really the key to effective effectively designing game worlds is interactivity. You know, in games like Half Life One and Duke Nukem, for example. Where there are all of these tiny little crafted interactive moments where you can go over here and turn on a water faucet or flush a toilet 
and there's a little joke. Uh, go and Duke Nukem, you, you look in the mirror and he says like, damn, I look good, or so, some shit like that. Uh, you, you know, Half-Life 1, the, the famous, you, you, you press E on the microwave a bunch of times and it explodes. Like this, those sort of in, little tiny interactive details make those worlds, even though they don't look anything like real life, they feel more like real life. It, because they feel like worlds where you can reach out and touch stuff and do stuff. Um, but in a, a, a highly crafted and very realistic uh, 3D world, that isn't linear like Half-Life 1, but is, is open, um, you know, it can feel like it can look really good or look really realistic, but it doesn't feel realistic because it's just a shell. It's very obviously a shell. Like, development time would be much better spent making those interactive elements. Like, can you imagine if that had been the, the road that the industry had gone down? Rather than, uh, you know, pumping more and more development time into graphics, making higher and higher poly count models. I mean, I think this plays back into the, the uh, conspiracy. <laughs> The, the, I mean, they're conspiring. It's a conspiracy uh, between video game developers and graphic cards, graphics card hardware developers, um, where it's like, you know, you need to push out new uh, video games that are more and more demanding so that people will kill, uh, keep buying the next generation of graphics cards. Um, like, it's not a secret that video game uh, developers and graphics card companies, um, you know, collaborate. At, and have deep, deep relationships with each other. This is this is like a. It's not a secret that they do this. There are like, just as a random example, I believe there's like a thing in in The Witcher Three for the hair that like only works on Nvidia graphics cards because they had some sort of deal together. Um, like there's a lot of stuff like that, um, which to me points towards the fact that there's this conspiracy in the industry to you know push. Uh, the, the public demand towards Im Im improved, more realistic, higher poly count, higher resolution textures and graphics. But can you imagine if the industry had gone and taken all that development time and put it into the interactivity that you see in some of those 90s games? The worlds that we could be living in, the digital virtual worlds where everything has some sort of handcrafted interaction. I mean, I think that would just be incredible. Uh, even if it doesn't look photo real, it doesn't matter because it feels like a real place. You can actually reach out and touch stuff and the world responds. There's so many video games, you know, they just, they're just they just arenas. They're just, they're just a box. It doesn't matter if the box looks like a real place or if it looks like a PS1 game or if it looks like Team Fortress 2 or whatever, you know, the world is just so static. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like in a game like TF2 or Counter Strike, um, you know, in Counter Strike, you kind of want the world to just be a bunch of boxy walls and corridors because that's what the game is built around fundamentally. Like the, the interactive element doesn't come from the environment, uh, it comes from interactions with real other players. But in a single player game, I think there's an argument to be made for. Uh, you know, a significantly higher degree of interactivity. You know about to whip up a band. Oh yeah, 1984, 1984, 186, medium. Ooh. What the hell? That's my theory. I think it's Beat It. I think it's Beat It by Michael Jackson. Nope. Ooh. I don't know what this is, but it goes. If it goes. Yeah. I don't know what song this is, but it, it bangs. Oh, I need a hero. Is it just called Hero? 
That's definitely the song, right? What the fuck is it called? Holding out for a hero, Bonnie Tyler? Yeah, let's fucking go. Let's hear the whole song. Yeah, yeah. Let me explain to you why they can't stop me. Okay, you see this? Firstly, you see this. This is my bass guitar. If I play an instrument, I play a bass guitar, right? Here's a problem. Bass guitars, you need to plug them in. And this bitch, this bitch ass piece of shit, it's fucked. The cable is fucked, is loose. Now, if I, I'm, I'm sure that if I had a soldering iron, I could take off this shrink wrap, heat heat shrink, whatever the fuck it's called, and resolder these two bits together and fix it. But I don't know how to solder, and I don't own a soldering iron. Um, probably should learn that at some point. But anyway, fuck Amazon, obviously, for many reasons. But they also sold me a busted ass cord, broke within a week. So pieces of shits can't record no bass guitar. Um, but they can't stop me, right? See, I just made a hit. See, I just made a hit. And your thing is, you just you just rev up the bass that's in here. Little, very simple MIDI bass. If I turn all the effects off. Right? You're probably thinking, this sounds slower than the normal song. Yeah, I record it slower, and then I speed it up make your voice sound more ethereal when you're going for a dreamlike sound. Motherfuckers don't know nothing about music. So, uh, yeah. This very simple MIDI bass, right? This whole bit? I mean, tell me that's not inspired by... Tell me that's not inspired by James Jameson. You can't tell me that because it clearly is. And then you put a little, you know, we're doing a post-punk thing. So first thing you gotta do, put an amp on it, right, to make it sound more real, like in a, like in a amp simulation, right? A little bit of amp simulation, right? And then uh, we're gonna chorus effect and a little spring reverb, make it sound, make it have that post-punk Blue Monday sound, right? Chorus is a bit fucked on this, but it's fine actually. And then we compress it. We give a little bit of overdrive, just give it some more harmonic interest, and excite it just to, which is not even doing anything. I don't know, I must have turned that off at some point and just forgot to. Anyway, then you get these, these little ethereal guitars. You know what the fuck that is? You know what the fuck that is? That's this. That's a, a child's, broken child's guitar. A broken look. It's the the neck is coming off. It's literally taped together. It's a broke. Look how high off the look at how high off the bridge the strings are because it's like bent forwards and you can just bend it backwards. <laughs> like it it's like literally falling apart. Held together with literally held together with duct tape and it's a child's guitar and it's completely fucked right out of tune. But don't matter because I just. It works. I managed to tune it just enough to get a few notes <laughs> to make a song. Okay. Yeah. Tune it just enough to double track it. And literally doesn't even have any effects. Like the only effects, if I turn this off, it's just double tracked, panned left and right. Right? And then this, we just have a little amp simulation. Really just for the spring reverb and to add a little bit of texture. And then just a massive fucking IR reverb. Uh, I'm gonna turn the bass back on. And then we got all the synths. The drums, they don't really matter that much. I mean, they do, but. So, you know, I got all sorts of shit going on over here. I got all sorts of shit going on. 
but it's not too crazy. It sounds a little crazy, but it doesn't sound that crazy. It's pretty not that crazy. But these synths is where it gets crazy. See, people don't even know. I got three layered synths. We got. This is the first one I made. You can't even really hear this in the song. Um. But yeah, this is just like an arpeggiator. It's a very. It's just a preset. It's just this fresh R and B default Logic preset. I mean, I fucked with it a tiny bit, but really, the only thing I did was. You can't hear this because it's coming out of the speakers, but if you put headphones on while you're listening to the song, it pans back and forwards. Give some motion and texture to the background. Then this, I got the arpeggiator to, to go up an octave every time it repeats, which sounds fucking sick. Yeah, and again, this is just a preset. I, oh no, wait, this I made this from scratch, never mind. But it's, it's not a... That, that one's not a preset. I did I did make that, that FM noise from scratch. But yeah, then I, I mean, it's just got an echo. It's very basic stuff. Like, none of this is complicated at all. Right, and then just a little pad. Again, I just made this real quick. Super basic pad just to add some low mid frequencies because the song feels kind of empty without it, but it's super low in the mix. As you can hear. Um, and that's it. That's how you make a fucking song. And then this... Again, also the same Broken Child's guitar. Just a super fucking sl- Like, hear how dry the signal is in contrast with the rest of the song, which is super wet. It, I think that t- the, the, the effect of that is really cool. I didn't think it would fit at first, but once I tried it, and then I've got this slammed fucking noise gate, right? <laughs> and then super heavy distortion and overdrive it's actually only the overdrive that's doing anything but a pretty heavy that and then amp big gain 10 out of 10 gain okay and then cut some of the lows out so it's not so muddy a little bit of compression nothing too crazy um but yeah, and that is just, again, the same child's guitar, just through the mic, with some amp simulation and, and stuff. Uh, and you can tell it's, like, not in tune, right? Because it's it's a broken guitar. <laughs> but it kind of sounds sick. It kind of fits. I tuned it the best I could, and then just, just tried to get it to work. Um, and it fits. It works. And then the vocals is what took me the longest. Uh, I really wanted the effect of like a very heavy echo uh, or delay. Once I came up with the vocal line and recorded it, I was just like, very heavy delay. That's what this needs. I don't know why, but... It is auto-tuned, and well, it's not auto-tuned. It's manually tuned, <laughs> but it's it is tuned. The vocals are tuned because uh, I'm not a very good singer, but also because I wanted the again artificial sound. Um, and you'll see that the the uh, the verse vocals are panned harder left and right than the chorus vocals so the chorus, it's the song literally comes together for the chorus that's a little fun trick i mean yeah is this is all just super basic rudimentary production stuff i mean then uh, this is my weird lo-fi setup that i created for this song so first of all this fat effects is just Adding it's it's mainly just for compression, um, but it has a nice little distortion circuit when you compress it as well. And then I'm just booming the fucking bass because if I don't have this, the kick just disappears. You can't hear the kick. So this was just to bring the kick back basically, and then add like a tape style, uh, you know, cut in the highs. <laughs> then I'm using this vintage EQ. Um, basically just for this, just to add some 
like drive that sounds like a it's gone for a little bit you know get a little more of a vintage feel and then i'm just obviously putting everything through uh, ott because because i'm a modern producer and that's what we do just slam everything through ott and then just the it on top to make sure it doesn't peak if this is shit, like you don't, this, I'm breaking many, many rules here. You don't do this if you don't know what you're doing, okay? I'm doing this on purpose because I know what I'm doing. I know the sound that I want and I know how to break the rules. But you got to learn the rules before you break them, right? This, this master bus chain is kind of like anyone, if you know anything about music production and you see this, like this is insane. This is what an insane person does. You do not do this. Uh, but I wanted a very specific sound. So, um, you know, I did it on purpose, but you know, that's how you make a hit. I whipped this up in like, what, nine, 10, 11, 12, one, three hours, three hours. I whipped this up. It was fucking, I don't know, maybe about four hours. Right. And now I'm going to have a hit on my hands and that's how you do it. When you're beast, beast molded. And you know, the reason I did this because you want to know what my next album actually sounds like a <laughs> yeah, sneak peek. Sneak peek, you want to know what my next album actually sounds like? My next album sounds mostly like this. Okay, let me skip forward. This is most of what my next album sounds like. It's just sort of, you know, a little bit of, a little bit of that, maybe a little bit of that. Right. So, you know, we got to get something out there that's going to get people to actually listen to my shit. And then maybe I can push them towards some of the noisy, good music. Not that this isn't good music. Not that I, not that everything I make, everything I make is good music because I'm a good, I'm a good person. And you can be too. If you go to patreon.com forward slash no thank you, the O's are zeros and donate like $3 a month. song yesterday uh this one hold on yeah this song pretty good song and i think i want to try and bang out a post-punk ep or album as fast as possible um Mainly because I need the money. Uh, so I'm going to, and it's not like I'm doing this because, I mean, I also like doing it. Uh, it's really nice having a job that's enjoyable. Unfortunately, this cable broke. But now, my new cable arrived. And this is why Amazon is based and Jeff Bezos deserves his billions. <laughs> Let's get things moving. Now, the reason I don't, I don't normally sort of show my work as it were, uh, with regards to music, for a couple of reasons. Um, one being, I kind of like the surprise element of it, right? I kind of don't, I don't, kind of, I feel like I don't want people to know what I'm making before the it's finished and the album's out. Um, and secondly, uh, because I haven't really figured out a good way to do it. And um, what I mean by that is, I don't have a set of speakers or monitors 
other than my laptop speakers. Uh, okay, we have a uh, bass connected now. tune here. Okay, I think I'm warmed up now. Time to make some music. Let's make a new nice riff. That's what we need. We need a nice little post-punk riff. I gotta edit all of this down. This is gonna be fucked up to edit. Let me slow down a bit. That's it, that's the that's the play. And then I need something to go for the verses. That's it, that's it. Just super, super simple. There we go. Oh, hello. Okay, second time when we do that. The trick to post punk is put chorus on the bass guitar. I have drumsticks right here. Yeah, okay, let's get those drums down. Nope. Sounds like ass and garbage and shit. I don't know if that's a little annoying. Maybe I should maybe I should change. song we got a song and then what else do you want in a post-punk song okay let's 
pretty good. Um, I feel like a synth would probably be nice. Maybe a little counter melody. But we're good for now. Um, okay, now I need for the verse. Or, what I, or the chorus, whatever this ends up being. convinced about these guitars yet though. It might be best to just leave it like this. I'm not convinced about the, this. Sounds a bit too much. Honestly, keep it minimal. Keep it minimal is not a bad show. Just bass, guitar, and drums like a real band. Okay, pretty good. And then we basically got a song. Unless we want to do a bridge. I hate bridges. Bridges, they just, they just exist to make the songs longer. We're not doing a bridge. We're doing vocals. Okay. We're doing mixing and then we're doing vocals. So mixing, I need to put headphones on. So, good luck editing this. Mm -hmm. 